Please be seated. We are back on the record in calls. Number 94, 0809328, the state of Texas versus Daniel Villegas. We are back from our lunch break. I hope you had a very nice lunch. I hope you had a light lunch. We're going to continue working. When we took our lunch break, uh, Ms. Butterworth from the DA's office was uh, asking direct questions of the witness, Daniel, David Rangel, and we're going to pick up at that point. Ms. Butterworth, you may proceed. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rangel, we had a short break, and so I'm going to start with my question again. Um, at some point, and so let me just backtrack just a tiny little bit. This statement was given to the police department on April 21st of 1993. You would agree with that, right? Yes. Both of these, the written and the typed. Correct. Then you had an opportunity, and then your cousin was arrested based on that information that same night. Were you aware of that? I was not aware. Okay. So I heard later, but I was not aware of it at that night. Okay, but you heard later that he was arrested on the 21st. Whatever date it was, but I did hear it. Okay. Then, um, let me do some math. Then, in December of 1994, so approximately a year would have been April 94, and then to December 94, um, these charges are pending against your cousin. And you have an opportunity to be questioned about this in December of 1994. Okay. He has a lawyer at that point. Um, you're saying that there was no reaction from your family. Did you ever meet with his lawyer uh, before that time that you spoke again regarding this issue? I may have. Okay. Again, but it's been a while. Okay. So you may have met with his lawyer. Um, and it's now been approximately a year and a half later, these charges are pending against your cousin, and you have an opportunity to talk about this again. Are you following me? Yeah, I'm going to object to leaving. Just a little leeway, but uh, in this area, but, uh, I will take your objection under advisement. Are you following me? So now we're talking about an opportunity that you've had to talk or, or to tell to talk more about this issue in December of 94. Okay. All right. Um, at that point, do we hear this, um, do you talk about the fact that you had uh, told the El Paso Police Department that your cousin had used a shotgun and that that part in your statement was not true? Is that, is that sorry, the first you time? Rephrase that, I'm sorry. Sure. Is that the first time you talk about the fact that you had actually told the El Paso Police Department that your cousin had told you you used a shot or he used no, a no. shotgun? No, it was mentioned when I was being interrogated by Marcus. Okay, right, but, but this is the first time you tell anybody else. I understand. So maybe let, let's back up. You know, I'm object. It's compound and she's misrepresenting the statement. She asks a question. I'm going to ask her a told, legal I'm objection. My, I'm making my objection. A legal it's objection. objection. Argumentative, you're on a misstating facts, not in evidence. I'm going to overrule those, but I need you to ask one question at a time. Yes, Judge. Uh, All right. Why don't you, why don't you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury um, what you want to tell them regarding the shotgun? So these two statements, right, I'm looking at them, and I do remember the reason why this one versus this one, my own handwritten statement, there's a lot less information versus this one, is because Marcus started typing his own words into some of these. And you're asking me, is this true? And I'm like, yes, this was said, but like I told Marcus, I knew it to be false. That's what I kept telling Marcus the entire time. And so in regards to the shotgun, when I mentioned the shotgun several times to Marcus, Marcus didn't like that answer. So he kept yelling at me, saying, no, that's not correct. That's not correct. So I didn't know what he needed and what he wanted for me to say. OK. So after your cousin is arrested in April of 1993, 
When did you go back to the police department or the DA's office and say, I, I need to explain to you that this isn't true or however it is that you said happened? I stated when did you tell, listen to my question, when did you go back to the police department? Your cousin has been arrested for capital murder. When did you go back to the police department to tell anyone about what happened to you on April 21st of 1993? I didn't go back to the police department. You never went to the police with this information? Not that I'm aware of, no ma'am. But, but you're going to be, are you, are, do you know what you did? Did you go back to the police department to tell them? Jason Compound. I'm sorry, rephrase that. Sorry. Did you go back to the police department after your cousin gets arrested for capital murder to clear this mm -hmm. up, to tell somebody what happened? I don't believe so, and the reason being was because of the way that the, the detectives handled me the first time. I was actually afraid to go back. I don't want the to experience answer, what I experienced that time being interrogated. The answer is no. You, you never went back to a police department to clear up any, any of this. The answer is no. Correct. Never came, I don't remember that. Okay. Never came to the DA's office to talk to anyone with the DA's office to clear up any of this? No. The first time that we hear about this is when you're given an opportunity to talk about it in December of 1994 after you've met with your cousin's lawyer. Is that correct? I believe so. Well, from your standpoint, that, that, that we hear about it. you this. hear about it, yes, because okay. Marcus omitted it. Okay. And at that time in December of 1994, you're even living with the defendant. Is that correct? Correct. If I remember correctly. <clears throat> and so you're having to answer questions about the fact that you came forward and gave this information regarding your, your, your cousin while you're living with him. I'm going to object leaving. She continues to lead the witness on direct. I'm going to refer to your first um, typewritten statement, Mr. Ranhell, and I'm going to show you at the bottom of it on the, so on the second page, where your signature is, there are, it looks like two, two lines of signature for witnesses, and it looks like it was also notarized. Is that correct? I see it here, but I don't remember. Okay. Is that what you see here, though? Two witnesses that, that, uh, that sign off, that right. they watched you on sign the, the statement? Side? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am that they watched you sign this statement, and it looks like it was also notarized. Your statement was notarized as well. Do you see that? Yes, I do on the right-hand side by Dwayne Johnson. Okay. And are, are you suggesting that these people also were, well, you tell me, were they part of, um, This conspiracy to, to make you say false things or to put lies in your statement? They weren't there when this was being written. Maybe when I signed it, but when it was being written and when it was being coerced out of me, there, were, there was no one there but Marcus and myself. Okay. But you sign it, and you know those people are there to watch you say that this is the truth. And you don't tell anybody anything? I don't remember being, them being there, but at that point, the way they were threatening me, I just signed whatever they were given. Okay. If that was ever given to me, I just wanted to get out of there. Okay. And you keep saying they. Who is they threatening you? Mr. Marcus. But you keep saying they. Well, the police, the, the detective. So when I say they, I'm referring to Detective Marcus. Okay. So you're not saying, you don't say he, you say they? Well, they is the police department. They are, Laredo and Marcus initially picked me up. And then Marcus had me by himself. Okay. Even though you have said that Detective Marcus is the one that was typing this up, we have gone through this, and everything in this is the truth except for the part about the gun. Is that correct? 
This is the truth, even though I knew that it was bullshit. Listen to my question. Is this the truth? Is this what your cousin told you? Is all of this correct, except for the part about the gun? This is correct. From this is what sir, your cousin you told you. Well, I'm, I'm just making sure that I'm trying to understand correctly. Is this what your cousin told you? Yes. This is the truth. Listen to my question. I promise you're going to you're going to have an opportunity. Is this the truth? Is this what your cousin told you? What is that? I'm going to object to compound. There's a difference in what Mr. Vegas told him and whether it's the truth. Sir. Well, I'm, this is the reason why I'm. I'm you, want to, you want to give an explanation? She's not asking for an explanation. Yes, sir. Answer her question. Yes, sir. This is what your cousin told you. Yes. There was nothing in here that Detective Marcus added to help his cause on framing somebody innocent that he added in here. This is. This is what you told him. This is what I signed, but he did add. I'm looking at this statement versus this one, and I remember him adding things to this statement, okay. which he had me sign. Was there anything he added to this statement that you did not tell him your cousin told you? Do you want to look at it again? Please. I'm sorry, say that again. So I'm just making sure, again, I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. We're in agreement that this has a lot more detail than the handwritten one. Correct. Is there anything that Detective Marcus added into this statement that you did not tell him that your cousin told you? For one of the things that I'm seeing is the guys in the vehicle. Is that his homeboys, I knew most of his friends. So I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this. And I'm like, I know there's things that were added, and I would say that would be one of the things in regards to the vehicle, adding that there was people there. Because when I was speaking to my cousin, it was just Daniel and Marcos that was mentioned, not homeboys or okay. multiple people. You didn't say that this morning. Well, you I'm looking at it. I've had a chance to review it. And again, I'm trying to remember everything because it's so far back. And so to the best of my recollection, you're asking me the question. So I'm doing my best to answer that. And I think I asked you maybe five times this morning, was everything that you told him, did you tell him all this? Did you say this? And you kept saying true, 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 true. So I'll let you fix it. Anything else you want to qualify? Do you object to any sidebar, Your Honor? Anything else you want to qualify in this statement that Detective Marcus added that was not true, that wasn't what you told him? I think that's the biggest one. Anything else? Not that I'm aware of, no ma'am. Okay. This is, now's the time. Super important. I'm doing my best. Okay. Again, this was a long time ago. I understand. But this morning, everything was truthful. Well, so I, I'm just trying to figure out no, why I, that's I changed. I understand, but like coming into this, this type of, this arena, so to speak, there's a lot of nervousness. So I'm, I'm trying to breathe and calm myself down so I can do my best. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you the opportunity. Nothing else that he planted or put in here that you did not tell him? I, from what I'm seeing, from the main one is the guys in the vehicle. I, I right now, I, I'm skimming it. I'm trying to do my best, but that's what I'm seeing currently. Okay. And so 25 years later, as you sit here on this witness stand. Yes, ma'am. You now say, I didn't tell him that. I didn't say that he was with other homeboys from B&E. Correct. You remember that. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at these statements, and that's, again, I'm doing my best to remember, and that's what I'm remembering. Like I, Daniel, from my recollection from the conversation, it was only Daniel and Marcos Gonzalez. Okay. So let's look at your handwritten one again. Do me a favor. Look at the last line. This is your handwriting. So this isn't Detective Marcus putting anything in. The only other passenger that I knew was Marcos. The other ones were his homeboys from v &E. When I was writing out, there was two. This is the second one. When I was writing the first one, there was a lot of things that the detective did not want me to, he either did not want me to put or he asked me to change. 
So this is your handwriting. Correct. It is it's my handwriting. It's in there. It, it's in there. This is your handwriting. Correct. It says that there's other the the other ones were his homeboys from VE. Correct. And so you're saying what now? At first you were explaining that he, he must have changed it in the typewriter. How is he changing your handwriting? There were certain things that he omitted and had me put on the clip. When I was when I was sitting on, when I was sitting there, essentially Marcus said if I didn't do the things he asked, he was going to charge me with a crime. So when you're a 17 year old kid and you're faced with these types of allegations and you're feeling it, there's a lot of things that you're willing to do and not do. And so I don't remember writing this, and I don't. And for the most part, again, Marcus had me add and omit certain things. So this is what I'm telling you with my, the best of my ability, today. Okay. All right. I do appreciate your help, Mr. Hanna. I pass the witness. Mr. Spencer. <coughs> Good afternoon, sir. I'm here. Good afternoon, sir. Let's talk about how you initially came to uh, come in contact with the El Paso Police Department. How was it that you, be, uh, you uh, came in contact with the El Paso Police Department? Well, I, initially it wasn't me, it was my mother. So, I believe detectives called my mother, and my mother called me, stating that there was a harassment phone call charged against me. And was there a harassment charge pending? Yes. Yes, there was. That the records indicate there was a harassment call pending. Correct. And so you the, the, you were told to come in to talk about the telephone harassment? My mom says, take, call the detectives, take care of it. And so I immediately did it so I wouldn't be in trouble, so to speak. So, to speak. so what they told me was, if you come, sign the, you're just going to sign a few documents, we'll release you. It was more of like, a, they made it seem it was more of like a matter of formality. Okay. So who did you call at the El Paso Police Department? Do you know? I believe it was Graves. It was um, you know, the, Graves or Arbogast. It was uh, the first group that picked me up initially. And they took you down to uh, the CAP office? They took me down to the substation in the Northeast, which I believe was at, in Hondo Pass at the time. And then from there? So from there, they took me in there, and they said, we're going to get some documents real quick for you to sign. And then when I was sitting there, a second group of detectives came in, and I saw them discussing with the first group that initially picked me up and said, we have him on our list, like, we need to speak to him too. So when that happened, I was kind of curious as, why do these guys need to speak to me now? I, I was still under the impression that it was regarding the harassment charge. So they picked me up, and from the substation in the, the Northeast, they start taking me to the one in Five Points. The Crimes Against Persons, CA, the CAP office. Whatever that may be, okay. so that's where they took me. And so now I'm getting a little nervous, because I'm like, it seems more than just harassment charges. So I asked him kind of nervously, am I, is there something going on? Am I in trouble? And he's like, oh yeah, you're in trouble. And he didn't want to tell me what was going on. So that car ride was really long for me. From the Northeast to Central, I'm just, my mind starts racing. I'm kind of wondering what's going on at this point. So you eventually get to CAP and who did you, who, which is the detective that you spoke with? In Five Points? Yes, sir. Marcus. Detective Marcus. So what does Marcus tell you? So we get there and I, start, and I ask him what's going on. He says that he knows someone that says that I'm guilty of capital murder. So he starts saying that I'm guilty of it. And I, at that point, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, we know you did it. And I'm like, did what? We know you killed those, those boys. And at that point, my mind starts racing. That's when things start to go really fast. Were you scared? Definitely. Scared. Like, even talking about it right now still kind of puts me in that moment. And that fear comes back, even as a 42-year-old man. So it's... Sorry. It, uh, it, it is tough. And... Um, he goes... We know you did it. So the detectives are accusing you of a capital murder? Correct. And they told you about the two boys in Northeast El Paso? Yes, they said that they had someone to, to pin me. And so he, asked, so he asks me, tell us, you know, tell us why you did it. I'm like, I had no idea. I'm like, I'm just there wondering, first of all, why am I there to begin with? And then why are they trying to, char why are they trying to charge me with murder? 
And so we're going there back and forth, I don't know, maybe a matter of a few hours, I couldn't tell you exactly what time. So I started thinking to myself, you know, what is it? I'm just trying to search my mind, what, what's, you know, what is it, what are they trying to say? And then so I asked him, like, are you talking about the story my cousin told me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, tell me that. Tell me the story your cousin told me. And so I started writing down, which was the first statement that I keep talking about that Mr. Marcus threw away. And so I wrote down what he told me. And then he gets the paper and he crumbles it up and he says, no, 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 that's not correct. That's not right. Now, so let's talk about that conversation. So at some point you had a conversation with, with Daniel. This was a few days. This was maybe uh, several days after uh, April 10th of 1993, correct? Uh, the initial conversation that we were talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. Correct. So I was, I was at a friend's restaurant, um, one of my best friends who was my next door neighbor at the time. And we used to, I believe it was called La Mexicana, off of Chelsea Street. We used to help his father do like chores after school. We would go, we would hang out, we'd eat, we'd do chores. And so that's where I made the phone call from. Was this about a week after the, the incident? I guess roughly about a week or so, because... Had it, there been a lot of publicity in the paper about this incident? Yeah, we all knew about it, just because it was... And, and, in, and in the paper, uh, it, it described who the boys were, how the shooting happened, about the car going back and forth, that was in the public domain. From what I remember, correct. That information was in the public domain. Do you remember reading that? Did you uh, read the paper? I did read the paper. I was, actually I like to read a lot. That was, that was kind of my reputation as a kid was being a nerd, so to speak. Okay, so you make a phone call, you're talking to Daniel, mm -hmm. and he makes a statement to you about him being the shooter, right? Correct. Guess who did it? Right? Correct. And then, did you take him seriously? No. Initially, when he told you, did you take him seriously? No. Well, well this is the thing is that from the time Daniel and I have been kids, Daniel was always the kid that exaggerated about everything. He was, that's just the reputation he had. Like, when we were talking to girls, he was Italian, or he had a lowrider that was always in the shop. He was a 16-year-old kid, barely even owned a bike. But when I would look at him as he was discussing this, he would like, <coughs> like, you know, with his big grin on his face. So, so when Daniel told me these things, you know, because he made up a lot of stuff, you just, you don't take him seriously. Did Daniel own a car at the time, in 1993? No. Did Marcus Gonzalez own a car in 1993? No, Marcus was almost homeless at that time. Okay. So, did you tell Detective Marcus that it was a joke? I did. When... When did you realize during the conversation with Daniel that it was a joke? Well, during the conversation, I, I mentioned it earlier, Marcos was laughing in the background. And he's like, don't believe him, he's bullshitting you, is the words he was telling me. And then did they laugh? Well, they, everyone was laughing. Again, they liked to, we used to one up one another. And so we, me being, I guess, naive, they would, they would say a lot of things a lot and before, you know, prior, you know, when I was a little younger, I used, I used to believe a lot of these stories, but as we got older, I always knew Daniel not to be very honest. That joke has turned into Daniel's nightmare. You're aware of that? Yes. But nonetheless, when he told you that, and he clarified that it was, and he told you that he was just joking. Did you believe that it was true? No. That he, had, that he had shot those kids? No, because Daniel, you know, the things that Daniel used to tell me, I know it didn't happen. That's just the type of person he was. And in 1994, you told, you said the same thing. You testified to the same thing, didn't you? I did, correct. And in 1995, you've said the same thing. Yes. And in 2011, you said the same thing. Yes. You have been consistent with what you said that he didn't mean it. It Correct. was a joke. Marcus coerced you. Marcus threatened you to charge you with capital murder. He pretty much said if I didn't sign this, that he was going to charge me with capital murder. And that, and excuse my language, I was going to get, I was going to get fucked in prison. At the time, I was 17 years old, probably weighed about 100 and. 1,520 pounds, he says, those guys are going to have their way with you. So when someone tells you that you're going A, going to prison, and you're going to get raped, 
you start to visualize a lot of things. <coughs> May I approach the witness, sir? Yes, sir. Let me show you what I've marked as defendant's exhibit number four and ask you if you recognize defendant's exhibit number four. It's me and Daniel. Yeah, you know, is this, uh, well, how old were you at the time this picture was taken? About 16, 17 years old. Okay. Uh, is this a fair and accurately, is this a fair and accurate depiction of what it purports to be? Yeah, maybe a little younger, but yes. Okay. Your Honor, I move to introduce defendant exhibit number four. Yeah. My question would be the relevance. Your objections are oral defense exhibit four is admitted into evidence. That's what you looked like at the time that you were in the hands of Detective Marcus. I was a little older there, but roughly. So you were actually a year younger. Correct. Or you were about a year younger. I was, I'm older in this picture. I'm about, again, probably closer to 18 in this picture. And when Marcus had me, my birthday's in February. This all happened in April, so it was just a little bit past 17. So Daniel would have been 17, a year older than when he was accused of this offense. Correct. So you both would have been another year younger. Roughly. Tell me, when Detective Marquez, when you wrote the first report, the first uh, handwritten uh, note, um, the indication was that you had written in there something about a shotgun, because that's what Daniel had told you when he told you on the phone, right? Correct. So every time that the prosecutor this morning kept telling you, is it true, is it true, is it true, you're telling her it was true what's in the report. Correct. Because that's what's in the report. Yes, sir. You're also telling her it was true whatever it was that Daniel told you. Correct. Okay. But did you believe it was true that he had done the shooting? No. At the time that he told you, before you knew he was joking, did you think it was true? No. <coughs> Were you in a super stressful situation? It's probably the most stressful situation I've ever been in, sir. And they were asking you this morning about the relationship you have with Daniel's family. Remember that? Yes. Uh, have you had, do you still have a good relationship with Daniel's family? Yes. You're in here testifying a capital murder case and you're telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury exactly what it was that Daniel told you. Are you telling them the truth? Yes, sir. So when you tell them that Daniel told you that, that's what he told you, correct? Correct. But you're also telling them that he was joking and you told the detective he was joking and you told them that over and over again, correct? Yes, but he didn't want to hear it. Detective Marcus pretty much told me that you know, he didn't want to hear what I had to say in regards to that. And again, the statements that I knew when I first wrote it, when he threw it away, making me write this one again, it's, it's still hard. So this, this picture was after Daniel had already been charged, but you still had maintained a good relationship? Yes. Still do. Daniel understands what you went through with Detective Marquez. When Daniel, when Detective Marquez threw away the first statement, what did he tell you? He said it's not correct. He didn't like, he didn't like the fact that the shotgun was in there. That was the, that was the biggest, out of all of it, that was the biggest one that he did not like in the statement. Prosecutors being critical of you telling you why didn't you go yeah. back to the police department? Judge. Let's rephrase your question. <coughs> Have any sidebar argument? The prosecutor asked you, why didn't you go back to the police department? The same police department to the same detective that threatened you with capital murder and tell him what you had already told him. Correct? She asked you that? Correct. Does that make any sense? That's why I told Ms. Butterworth, why would I go there after what they did to me? Did you trust Detective Marquez? No. Did you think if you went and told Detective Marquez, he'd say, okay, let me correct the, 
your statement for you, David Ranhead. Did you think he would do that? No. And then there was asked, why didn't you go to the DA's office and tell him, you got the wrong guy, you made a mistake. Think they would have listened to you? I would, honestly, I wouldn't, I don't think so, but I would have never thought to go to the DA. Every time that you've been asked, about whether or not you thought Daniel was serious or whether he was joking. What has been your testimony under oath? Every single time you've asked. I've always said that I thought Daniel was joking. Say that again? I've always said I thought Daniel was joking. That you thought he was guilty? Joking. Joking. When you were asked with those statements, to sign here. Were you told if you sign here, I'll let you go, and if you don't sign here, you're not leaving here? He told me if I didn't sign it, I'd go to prison and be raped, is what he told me. So at that point, you'll sign anything to get your ass out of that situation you're in, especially as a 17-year-old kid. You nervous, Steve? Currently? Mm -hmm. It's not nervousness, it's more of anger, having to relive it, and frustration. Still dealing with this now, as a 42-year-old man. Did you think that Detective Marquez was going to actually arrest you and charge you if you didn't sign that statement? Yes. Let the record reflect and I'm tendering to the prosecutor defense exhibit <coughs> five and six the newspaper clippings of after of uh, December, I'm sorry, April 11, 1993 and April 12, 1993, the El Paso Times, the El Paso Herald Post. And if I just may have a second, maybe yes, after this witness to authenticate that these are, these are, these are correct. Yes, <coughs> So there was publicity and there was information in the public domain of what the police knew of what had occurred, is that correct? Yes, sir. And that was information that both Daniel knew and the public knew and you knew as well, correct? Correct. And not surprisingly, what's in your statement tracks a lot of what's in the public domain. That doesn't surprise you, does it? No. It's not something that's personal or just maybe the shooters knew, it's something that was put out into the public domain, isn't that true? Correct. When you said that both Danny and Marco and Marcos Gonzalez were laughing when they told you that, did was it a I got you moment? It was kind of like a sucker, like we fooled you type. mentioned in 1993 that neither Daniel or Marcos had a car. Did either one of those two boys drive? Not to my recollection. I don't remember, but we, we walked everywhere. The state has no objection to defense five and six. Defense exhibits five and six are admitted to evidence. <coughs> pass the witness. I have no further questions, but I would like to offer States Exhibit 40 and 41, which are the statements, so that the jury can compare the content of these statements to the content of what's in the newspaper articles. Can you judge? Still, statements are not admissible under the rules. His statements are admissible. Your legal objection is Hearsay. sustained. Uh, sir, you're, you're still subject to recall? Yes, sir. That means we may call you back and you're still under the subpoena power. Yes, sir. But you are free to leave. Please leave your phone number with my bailiff. And if we call you, we need to be back within 20 minutes to receive the call. Okay, well, 
I've seen your traffic. Is it okay? If maybe about 30 if I'm gone. <laughs> you know, I have said 20 minutes for 21 years, and I probably need to make it 45 minutes. And so I will make it 45 minutes. You're correct. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Montoya, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, the state calls for another move. Karen Lee Brooks? Yes, you may. going to happen, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please do me a favor. Go to your go to your home, away from home for a minute, while I take care of some matters. L lead us out, please. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. If that's the next witness, he needs to get rid of that gun. Never mind. Is Mr. Luhan here? Please be seated. Records should reflect we are currently, uh, the jury has been taken out of the courtroom. Sir, I need you to raise your right hand for me, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in these proceedings? Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please be seated. For the record, sir, I do need your name. I need you to spell your last name for us. My name is Armando Luján. L-U-J-N Luján. Armando or Fernando? Fernando. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Luján, it has been made, uh, come to my attention that there is a possibility that once uh, one or the other of the lawyers in this case begin questioning you about whatever it is that you've been brought here for, that at some point you may say that you don't want to answer a question or that you want to invoke your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. I don't know if you know what that means. I don't know if you mean, you know, it is taking the Fifth. And before you answer my question, you need to understand that should the prosecutor start asking you questions and 20 minutes later you don't want to answer, you would have to answer. And if you didn't object and then the other side started asking you questions, uh, you have to continue to answer questions. You couldn't pick and choose which questions you wanted to answer and which questions you didn't. Before asking you, if it is your intention not to answer any questions or to invoke your right not to answer questions, would you like to have a lawyer appointed to you to discuss the issue that may have been brought to my attention? Yes, I want to confirm. Judge, but, but, but for a second, first of all, I didn't know that he was coming in to take the fence, so this is something that the defense knew. Not sure how. Can you at least, there is nothing that, can you, can we at least talk about whether or not that he would have any realm of anything? He's, he's going to be called to, the to state say is, he was with the defendant the night before this happened, that okay. he went home at 9.45, he did check us out, that he was on probation. Where is he take, where is he getting a fit? I don't know. Do you need to flush that out first? I, I, Wait, why did we... Why would we stall? I, I don't understand. And, and I'll tell you, the rest of his statement is, is he's also going to tell back back then when he was interviewed, is he's going to say that I know the defendant had a 22 caliber. So humor me for a second. The defense knows he's taking the fifth. I don't know how. And now all of a sudden, a critical witness that's going to put a 22 in the defendant's hands is now being helped by his own lawyer, the defendant's lawyer, by saying, hey, he needs a lawyer and he needs to take the fifth. First and foremost, Ms. Butterworth, I'm not going to humor you. 
Secondly, it is possible, and I don't know, that he may have lied when he said somebody had a 22, or he may have lied when he said he was with somebody. I don't know. And that's why he now hears what you're going to ask him, and he's asked for a lawyer to help him decide whether he is going to invoke his Fifth Amendment. And, and I'd like to respond. I, I don't think there's a need to respond. I need to uh, get off the bench. I need to find if there's a lawyer uh, in the courtroom that I can turn, not in the courtroom, in the courthouse, that I can turn to immediately with regard to this. I, I'd like to at least put it on the record. I don't even want to respond, but I have to respond, put on the record to the alleged allegations the prosecutor made. Mr. Han stopped me out in the hall and said, I, why am I here? I said, I don't know, who are you? I'm Fernando Han. I said, I, I don't know. He tells me, I have told the prosecutors I'm going to take the fifth, that I don't want to testify. I don't know why I'm here. That's the first time I hear about it. I go, and Miss Butterworth knows that when she pre-trialed Mr. Luhan, she sends me an email saying, I did not, what's in my statement is not true, and it's not true because well, that Daniel never had a 22. I put that in there because Detective Marquez threatened me. That's what she tells me in an email to me. Right, right. I have a break. He, he, I have a duty. Do I believe that's true? Absolutely not. But I have a Brady notice to tell the defense, like, hey, guess what? Now here's another witness that wants to say he was threatened. And I, so I guess I'm not humoring you or you may believe he had, may have a reason to want uh, to avail himself to his constitutional rights. I'm not bringing the jury in. Uh, we are going to take a break. Do me a favor, sir. Go ahead and. Uh, there is a couch out there, a blue one, and if it's empty, go ahead and sit out there. And uh, I will get uh, somebody to come talk to you in a minute. All rise. May I give you his statement, Judge? Let me see. Two. Three, seven. 